right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, okay, grab your Bible or turn on your Bible app. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's where we're going to be at today. Thanks for joining us today. Chapter 11. We've been in the book of Corinthians for quite a while, and we are we're slowly making our way through. We're going to cover, uh, I think, the first half of this chapter here today, or at least do my best. All right, so before we jump into it today, um, we are jumping into what, might, what many have considered to be one of the hardest passages of Scripture to understand, at least in the New Testament. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's kind of where we're at today. Uh, as I was kind of studying and, and doing lots of research into this today, uh, one of the guys I like to look up is John Piper. He's been a pastor, theologian, Ph.D., been a pastor for 40 plus years. He's preached on like every book of the Bible. So I'm like, hey, how did, how did John Piper uh, address this passage? So I went onto his website where you see every single message he's ever preached since like the mid 80s. Uh, and, and he's never preached on this one apparently. So anyways, in good company. Glad for that. Thanks. Uh, he, anyways, okay. So uh, <laughs> uh, part of the challenge in this passage is that they, this is dealing with some cultural things in ancient Corinth that we're going to have to unpack today, okay? And another aspect of this challenge is that the Apostle Paul, he's, he's a really uh, technical writer. He, he, he is great at explaining things, and, and sometimes as he's writing, he'll use wordplay, and it's really this intricate thing. And so what that means is sometimes he's uh, a little hard to understand. I don't know if you ever have a friend like that, like you... Like, I'm trying to follow you, but I feel like, am I just not keeping up? Like, what's going on here? Um, And then the other thing that complicates things even more is that what he's addressing in this passage is gender roles within the church, okay? Uh, So, um, I I don't know if you know this or or not, but uh, gender is kind of a hot button topic today. I don't know if you've picked up on that in social media or in your workplace or whatever, but it's kind of a bit of an issue. Uh, So like I said, we've been in Corinthians for a long time. Just so happens we land here just as it's the first Sunday of Pride Month. That that is not, that's not intentional or anything right now. Um, uh, Derek's on sabbatical. Thanks, Derek. Okay, so uh, we're going to jump into this. so all the caveats, all the caveats as we jump into this, uh, and, and we're going to read the passage right away, because this is where we're at in the series, and, and I'm really excited. I think that this is actually really, really important for us. So hopefully you're there. Uh, we're going to start off on verse 2. So it says, Now I commend you, because you remember me in everything, and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as if her head were shaven, Uh, for if a wife were not uh, cover, will not cover her head, then she should cut off her hair, uh, cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover, let her, cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Like I said, it gets complicated. But Man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority over her head, because of the angels. Okay, yeah, that, okay, we'll, ju- we'll get into that. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? And does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? Sorry, got to cut your hair, guys. Uh, but if a woman has long hair, is, her, is it her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. Uh, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have... Uh, no such practice, nor do the churches of God. All right, there you go. That's the passage. 
super clear. I can probably just walk away right now, right? <laughs> Maybe not. We're, we'll, we'll dig into it. Uh, throughout this series, um, we've been encouraging you to, uh, to text in your questions uh, during the message. And, and I really, I mean, should probably go without saying, but I want to emphasize it again today that if anything, during the message or in this passage, you have, it sparks a question, you want to dig deeper into it, text in those questions. I'm going to answer one today, and the rest will be answered on the podcast. Our typical host already told me she's not going to show up. Um, but uh, but this, is, this is going to be a really good podcast. comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, it's always amazing. I talk with people um, just like how, how life's going, how, how they're digging into the Word. And, and often I hear from people saying the podcast has been really helpful because it's kind of, you know, part two of the message as we kind of really dig into the passage. So make sure you, you check that out, especially this week, because uh, I'm sure I'm not going to touch on every single aspect of the passage here today. All right, so that's where we're at. Um, this is an important passage for us. Uh, because of the world in which we live in. Um, as I already said earlier, th- there is a, a debate uh, d- around defining men and women. Um, in, in this debate, it, it, it's happening on, online, it's happening in schools, uh, in the government, uh, maybe even within your own household. Uh, and the debate primarily centers around uh, the question, uh, how are men and women different? And, and if there is this difference, what does that actually mean? W- what does this mean for us? And, and so that's kind of the debate right now. It's, it's super um, uh, politicized. Uh, but I want to really emphasize this, that, that this debate is nothing new. So often the things that we're doing in our culture is really just a rehashing of something that's already been happening. So uh, throughout history, there has been this debate about, uh, you know, uh, are are men and women different? And and what does this mean? How is society, as as in a culture, how do we actually deal with all of this? And so you kind of quickly look throughout history. Um, So, you know, there's a debate in the 1960s with the sexual revolution where it was kind of this idea that men and women should kind of just treat sex as, as the same. Um, and, and, but then this created all these issues. And we, we talked about that a few weeks ago, all these issues that came out of that. And then you go back even like a little bit further uh, of just like kind of culturally how uh, men and women viewed each other. Um, this week I was thinking about how uh, in 1912 when the Titanic hit the iceberg, how did the people on board that boat respond? Uh, and the way that they responded, it's recorded well, uh, that they decided that, hey, it's, it's women and children first into the lifeboats. And it's really interesting that, like, it wasn't up to debate. It kind of the captain was there and his, his right-hand man, and he said, Captain, we should do, uh, you know, women and children first. And the captain said, uh, you know, make it so. Like, that's what we're going to do. And, and so they loaded up the lifeboats, uh, even so much that some guys didn't jump onto a lifeboat because they were worried that, that there might be some women who are back in the line behind them. They don't want to take the spot. Uh, and then other guys did end up getting onto the lifeboat. They're like, I don't see anyone else around. I'm going to jump onto this thing. And, and when they got safely to shore, when they were rescued out of the ocean and brought back, uh, many of the men who were actually rescued that day uh, actually uh, face a lot of backlash from the culture around them of like, hey, like, why did you survive? And there's like women and children who didn't make it back from, from that tragedy. What, like, what's going on here? And so you see this cultural thing where they're trying to, like, differentiate, like, the value of people's lives just based upon gender. And you go back even further, late 1800s, where uh, the first wave feminism gave women the right to vote and to work in the workplace, and so work outside of the home. And then you see this debate going back and forth of they want to vote, but no, like, the men don't want them to. And you see this issue of, like, okay, so how are we going to actually deal with this? So Though it might feel like things are kind of intense today, there's been this debate throughout history on the distinctions between men and women. And and this is something so important for us as as a church, as followers of Christ, for us to wrestle with. Because, you know, as a church, it's really practically speaking, we're a church made of of men and women. Like, like, very practical there. And because we believe that both men and women are created in the image of God. 
that we carry around this, this thing called the Imago Dei, that we, we actually represent God here on earth, that we are unique in creation, created by him. So, so how we live our lives truly matters, and, and it matters primarily to God. Now, this isn't a, a neutral issue. It's something that's deep to the heart of God because he created us this way. And so we, we can't just turn a blind eye to this thing that's going on in our culture. This is where passages like this, though it might be a little complex, it's important for us to dig into. And, and I love diving into passages like this where, where God kind of makes you pause and think through. It's not just a quick read. You have to pause and just say, okay, God, what are you teaching me in this moment? And, and so, so often we have to approach the Word of God with this sense of humility. Uh, Paul, he says in chapter 8, you know, if anyone truly thinks he has understanding, he has to think again. And it's kind of the same thing when we jump into passages like this of like, okay, God, continue to speak to me, speak to us this morning. So as we dig into this passage, what we're going to see is that the Corinthian church struggled with how men and women should worship. The primary issue today is they're talking about worship, worshiping as a church body. Uh, the, the book of Corinthians can kind of be break, broken up into different segments. Uh, so first, it's talking about uh, conflict in the church. Uh, that's the first few chapters. Then Paul writes a few more chapters uh, on sexuality, then a few chapters on idolatry. And now we're getting into a section where it's all about worship. Uh, how do we come together as a church, as a, as a body of believers, and, and worship together? And the first thing he wants to address now is how men and women should worship. And, and often what he's doing is he's correcting the Corinthian church. And this is why we call this series Imperfect, because this is an imperfect church that he's writing to. And, and hey, like reality is that we're going to be an imperfect church as well. And so we need to hear these words from God. Uh, what they struggled with was really two main things. They, they first, they struggled from, um, with, with forming a, a biblical perspective on men and women. This was the first thing that they, that they struggled with. As one author put it, uh, they suffered from an over-realized eschatology. Uh, so what he means by that is, is that they kind of had this view that, hey, uh, does gender really matter if, you know, the new heavens and the new earth is already a reality? Like, hey, if we're going to spend all of eternity with God, like, hey, does, does men and women, does that, like, really even matter at the end of the day? And so they started acting as though men and women have no distinction between each other. So how they came together and worshiped together, they're saying, like, hey, there's no distinction. We can all just kind of do whatever we want to do. And it created all this chaos within the church. And so Paul first needs to correct them on that. He's like, hey, like, understand, like, no, like, no matter your view of eschatology, no matter your view of how, you know, how God is kind of weaving, you know, time and history all together, he says that, hey, no matter your view of that, we need to actually anchor ourselves in the Genesis creation story that God created us specifically as, as male and female. Uh, verses 8 and 9, he says, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Verse 9, neither was man created for woman, uh, but woman for man. Uh, what he's getting at there is this recap of the Genesis creation story. That man and woman were created uh, distinctly, uh, and they have an important relationship that they're supposed to have together. Verse 11, he goes on, he says that, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman, uh, for as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So he's saying, like, hey, like, we can't erase this. Uh, this is not something that we can play around with, that this is something that is a foundational to how God has created us. So we, to have this biblical perspective, we need to first understand that. But then they were also struggling from a cultural perspective as well, uh, that they were actually doing things that would have been uh, offensive within their culture. Uh, verse 4 says, and, and this is where, like, as we're reading it today, it might not have the full impact, so we need to understand exactly what he is getting at here. So verse 4, it says, 
Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And you read that, and you're like, okay, what does that mean that he dishonors his head uh, just by merely having something over top of it? Well, what, what he's getting at here is he, he's referring to the fact that they were acting like Roman priests as they would worship in their temple, that these priests, uh, in this phonetic frenzy of worship to their pagan gods, uh, that they would cover their heads with these togas as they're running around. And he's saying, hey, when I go to one of your worship services, you're, you, it, see, it feels like I'm in a, a pagan temple worshiping all these other gods rather than worshiping the one true God. That you guys are adopting things within the culture that has actually made you guys no longer distinct from those who aren't following Christ, but instead you're just, you're just copying verbatim what they are doing over there. And so he says, guys, okay, cut that out. And then verse 5 says, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. And again, just as he's getting, kind of getting after the guys here, he's, he's getting after the women as well. You know, Paul is just kind of equal rights, uh, just offend everyone as he's writing. And so he says, hey, to the woman, you're, you're acting like the temple prostitutes. Or, at the very least, you're acting like a sexually promiscuous unmarried woman because they have their heads uncovered and their hair flowing down. And again, in our culture here in Canada, like that, that maybe doesn't immediately make a lot of sense. But for them, at this point in time, the way that you would understand if a woman was, was married in a committed relationship was that she would wear a, a head covering in, in such a way that you would easily identify that. Kind of in, in the same thing, if you see someone who's wearing a, a wedding ring, you might say, okay, okay. They're, they're engaged or they're married. Okay, uh, that is understood. You don't have to go up to them and say, hey, like, why, why do you have that ring on that one particular finger? I don't really understand that. Like, like culturally, we understand certain things that are going on. Uh, but in this point, what they're doing is they're kind of throwing away all, all of these uh, cultural things that were, were, were understood, and they're getting into this time of worship that was creating all this chaos and confusion what was hurting their reputation as a church. The problem is that their worship together was confusing so that non-Christians, when they would join them, they would get mixed signals. You know, like, hey, like, are are you worshiping someone different than what we are over here? I, I thought you guys had something different. I, I thought that you're followers of Christ, but it feels like it's not different at all from the culture around me. If anything, it's, it's kind of more offensive of what you guys are doing here uh, than what I would see at the temple down the road. And so Paul, what he's trying to do is address them that they would have this proper sense of how they were to worship together as men and wor- women. And so this is our big takeaway from this. This is the practical thing that we need to understand, that as men and women, we must worship God in ways that are guided by Scripture and that is sensitive to our culture. These are the two things that we need to really understand and put into practice for us today. Uh, That we want to have a biblical view uh, of, of worship. Uh, that the Word of God is the thing that actually guides our time together. This is why when we gather that we, we study the Word of God. Uh, it's why when I come up here, I'm not just going to bring up a textbook or, or, you know, a latest, you know, book that was written by some great author and just say, hey, guys, you know, this, um, you know, this is a good book, but we're going to put this aside. We're going to read this other book that someone has written, recently written. Um, we, we, we need to be guided by, by the Word of God. Uh, And we need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's prompting in our lives and and as a church. This is why we pray often that the Holy Spirit is guiding us as a church body. So whenever a big decision needs to be made, uh, whether that's, you know, um, doing a big renovation or buying a church property or or, or hiring someone, or whatever it is in the future that we're we're often asking, Holy Spirit, continue to guide and lead us as a church because we want to be a church that worships uh, being led by Him. And so this is foundational to, to absolutely everything that we do. 
but we also need to be sensitive to our culture. You know, we, we need to understand that, that we can't help but be shaped in, in some way by the culture around us. Uh, you know, the way that we talk, the way that we dress, the way that we use technology, uh, even the, the style of, of music that we hear, have here uh, on a Sunday morning. I mean, all of this, in reality, is really shaped by the culture around us. It really, it's, it's influenced by it in, in many ways. And so, though we want to be countercultural when we need to be, we want to be sensitive to the culture as to not unnecessarily set up roadblocks for people to hear the gospel. And so this challenge comes uh, in, in two ways. So we, we're going to face this challenge as a church. The first challenge is that we're going to face the challenge of, of ignoring scripture uh, and ignoring culture. Um, the, the challenge comes, is, are, are we actually going to stick to the word of God? Uh, even when, it, when it's a hard passage to understand, even when it kind of goes against kind of our sensibilities, uh, are we willing to follow this fully to its full end? Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that we are going to face. Uh, we also need to contextualize our message and our actions for the culture uh, that we find ourselves in. Uh, we need to, you know, I, I think that in many ways that we're often better at this when we're doing uh, cross-cultural missions. Um, so I m remember years ago, uh, I was uh, in a meeting, and they're talking about, um, it was a meeting for getting ready to take some students to a, a mission trip to Turkey. And, and we had one guy there who had lived in Turkey for, uh, for many years, and he was kind of explaining all these things about dress code. Of, he's like, okay, so women, like, when you're there, you're going to have to wear certain head coverings at certain points. You're going to have to cover up in this way. Just culturally, that's acceptable in Turkey. And, and everyone's kind of like nodding along. Okay, yep, that, that's, that's just kind of how you do things over there. And, and I was just sitting back and just listening to all this. I'm like, it's so funny that he can freely say all of this. But, but if ever he said something up in the front saying, hey, like, um, I'm not sure if what you're wearing right now is really appropriate. Can you, like, you know, change this? Like, then everyone would get really upset. So, like, why is it that when we think cross-cultural, hey, we need to change ourselves, but here in this context, this is where there's some issues kind of come up. And, and so in that meeting, I asked them, I'm like, hey, so, you know, as a guy, like, you just addressed all the women, so as a guy, like, hey, what do I need to know about how am I supposed to dress over there? And he's like, no, you're fine. Like, you don't have to worry about that. And it was this interesting thing of like, no, like we need to like understand like how do we dress and present ourselves in the different cultures that we find ourselves in. And so we can't ignore scripture, we can't ignore our culture, but then the challenge also comes up of placing our culture above scripture. There, there's a movement right now to downplay the importance and distinction between men and women, it really does fly in the face of what the Word of God says. And so we can't just wholeheartedly just adopt what the world around us is saying. So we're not against the culture, but we're preaching to it. We're going to be countercultural in moments where, where we need to be, uh, but not in such a way that people around us can't actually hear what the Word of God is saying. So that is what this passage is about. And so um, for the rest of the time here, I want to address, first of all, what, what this passage is not saying, and then we'll spend some time saying, like, hey, here's what this passage is actually saying for us. Uh, there's been so much confusion around 1 Corinthians. Really quickly, let's dispel some of the most common misconceptions. So number one, uh, that men shouldn't wear hats to church, but women should wear hats. That's how some people have understood this. I'm looking out and just trying to see if there's anyone actually wearing a hat today. I don't see anyone. Okay, you're all in trouble. Okay, no. Uh, so many well-meaning Christians, put that in there, well-meaning, have taken this passage to mean that men cannot wear a hat in church. And so for some people, the most, the most offensive thing I could possibly do in front of them is take this hat and just put them on in front of them and be up here uh, preaching. They, they, like, some people like, they, like storm out here like, what? What's that guy doing? That's absolutely terrible. Um, this is like my best hat I have. I try to find a sports hat. I don't have it. It just says uh, dude, dad, because I'm a dad. I'm a dude. It's my favorite hat. That's what I usually wear. Uh, <laughs> and, and so 
Uh, this passage isn't talking about hats, okay? Uh, it's referring to pagan practices, okay? So you don't have to hit someone upside the head if they sit down for a meal and they're still wearing the baseball cap, okay? It's all right, okay? So anyways, that's some baggage with that one. Um, <laughs> number two, that men can't have long hair. This is verse 14 where it says, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace to him? Uh, when, when I was younger, uh, I have an uncle, and we were visiting him, and, uh, and I saw his Bible, and at the very back of it, he had some blank pages where he actually wrote down every single law and command that he found in Scripture. So every single one that, whenever he was reading and he found something that's like, hey, here's a command, he would write it down at the back of his Bible. And I was real young at the time, and I saw this, I'm like, that's Brilliant, perfect. I don't, you don't have to spend time reading this thing. You can flip to the back and it just gives you like the rules. If you just follow these rules, then, then you're good in God's eyes, right? And, and so his son, my cousin, um, he one day was like, um, it was like the 90s, and he was like, want to kind of grow out his hair, probably have a mullet or something. And, and, and so his dad takes his Bible, flips not to the Bible, but to the very back, and he says, nope, here. 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. men can't have long hair, go get, your, go get a haircut. So that was his perspective. But again, as we're reading this passage, uh, that, that can't really be what he's getting at here because elsewhere in Scripture, it, it's fine for men to have their hair long. Uh, for, for some men, it would be seen as a sign uh, uh, of great mourning, that they, they lost a loved one, and, and so while they're mourning, they'll let their, their hair and their beard uh, just grow out so that everyone would see uh, just, just the inner turmoil with inside of him. And then anyone who took the, the Nazarite vow would have long hair. It, it was a sign of, of piety within Jewish culture. And so what, what he's really getting at here is a specific issue within the church in Corinth where he's addressing this issue of having no gender distinctions. He's saying, hey, like, you're not growing out your hair because you're, you're pious. You're doing it because you don't understand that there's, there's actually a difference between men and women. You're trying to be, present yourself as, as more effeminate in the culture around you, and that's, that's dangerous, and that's going to present a lot of issues for you. And the last thing that this passage isn't saying is that all women must submit to all men. I made sure when they made my slides, they put on the up there what this passage is not saying so that no one can screenshot this and say all women must submit to all men. <laughs> That's a lot of issues. That's a lot of problems. This is what it's not saying. And, and where this comes from is verse 3 where it says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, the head of of Christ is God. Uh, in, in the Greek, the word a wife and woman uh, is, is often the same word, uh, and the same thing for man and husband. It's often the same word. So context really determines what's actually, how do you translate this? So in the, in the KJV, they just translate this as, as man and, and woman throughout this passage, but the ESV, I, I think, really captures it much better because it's not just talking about blanket term, all men, all women. He's talking about specific relationships that are happening. Uh, so, so this actually gives us a better understanding. So it's not talking about one being superior to the other. What he's talking about is how are you living in relationship with your spouse? So let's talk about what, what is this passage actually saying? Understand this. This is one of my main points here is that our actions can bring honor or shame to God. I'm hearing a bunch of buzzing out there. I don't know what that is. <laughs> our, our actions can bring honor or shame to God. Um, verse 3 uh, brings up this idea of headship. And, and so I think it's important for us to just pause and really focus in on that word for a second. Uh, if we're going to understand this passage, we need to really get this part right. Because like I said, Paul is really, uh, he has a lot of wordplay within this passage. Uh, everything else is this wordplay off of this word head. Or in Greek, it's kephele. 
Uh, when we think about someone being the head, uh, we, I think we automatically think of it as um, a, a position of authority. Uh, we, we think of a CEO or a president, uh, like someone who is kind of unilaterally in charge of something. Uh, but, but that can't be what this passage is getting at because it speaks uh, of God being the head of Christ. Uh, and, and we can't have that view uh, that actually flies in the face of the rest of Scripture, where God the Father is not presented as supreme over Christ. Instead, what we see is that there is this complete unity uh, within the Trinity. And so it's really important that we, we understand that aspect. That's again a distract me like the rest of the service. <laughs> Do you ever have that in your house where like um, you have a, a smoke alarm and the battery's dying and it, there's a beep and you're just trying to figure out like, where, where is that? Where is it coming from? I need to find this. I can't sleep tonight because that, that chirping is just going to keep me up the rest of the time. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, hopefully if there is something that needs to be addressed, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll continue on here. The church will be on fire, and Daryl will just be up here still preaching. Uh, <laughs> no one told me, guys. Uh. All right, all right, so let's get back into it. So, so it, it can't be seen as this, this view of uh, superiority. Uh, rather, it, it's better to have this understanding. This is how um, Andrew Wilson, uh, he wrote a commentary on it. He put it this way. He said that the heart of Paul's picture is not command and control like a Western organization, it is honor and shame like an Eastern family. And so he's saying that the head here isn't primarily uh, about being uh, in, in charge, unilaterally having authority. Head is one who is uh, responsible for those around him. And because of that responsibility, uh, that this is the one whose reputation is either honored or shamed by the actions of others. And so what he's saying here is that, you know, hey, within the family, that, that the man is supposed to be responsible for uh, his household, and then his wife is meant to show honor to him in her actions. In the same way that God, you know, is having responsibility within the Trinity, and so the rest of the Trinity is going to be showing uh, honor to the rest of the Trinity with, within this unity that they are experiencing right there. And so it's no longer about being superior over the other person. It's about having this relationship where things are actually flowing and working together, unified together in that relationship. And, and so he describes it this way, that the man is concerned about honoring Christ, and, and so he is going to act culturally appropriately in how he worships. And the wife is concerned about honoring her husband, though, though that isn't the ultimate thing. Ultimately, that she wants to bring honor and glory to God through her actions as well. And so we need to worship God in a way that which we can bring him more glory, not less. The second thing here is that men and women honor God in uh, distinct ways. Uh, through this passage, Paul is really showing that men and women are different. As I already said, verses 8 and 9, where he's really getting at the root of it, uh, that in creation, that men and women were created different from each other. And, and so this isn't an issue of value, it becomes an issue of distinction, uh, the distinction between the genders uh, is going to be coming out within our culture. And so that's kind of how it came up for them. As I already said, like, hey, as the woman will kind of uh, wear a, a covering over her head uh, in the same way in our culture that, hey, like, we'll wear a, a wedding ring to signify uh, that we are, that someone is married. And so that doesn't mean that, like, you have to wear a wedding ring, but it kind of becomes this, this thing that, hey, if, if someone's kind of in a cultural situation, normally they're wearing a ring, and they see some people around, so they kind of slide off their finger, put it into their pocket, because they don't want to be seen as taken, they want to be seen as available. Like, we would, we would understand that that kind of becomes a bit of an issue. Okay. Okay, so we have to, okay. 
All right. Uh, so we are going to step outside for a minute. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> uh, so if you want to make your way out, so um, there's exits off to the side right here. That's probably the best way. Um, make sure that you connect with your children. Um, okay, thanks, everyone. <laughs>